Today, just for today, we are jumping back, as you heard just a moment ago in the children's sermon, into the book of Revelation. And uh, we're not going to rehash, really, everything that we started to go over, I think it was last year sometime. But maybe we do need to even get back to that. I don't know. We're gonna, I'm going to pray over that. This morning, we're going we're gonna to turn to the second to the last chapter in the book of Revelation, and we're going to hear a word of encouragement that Jesus needed John's audience to hear. A word that they definitely needed to hear, but it's also a word that would really benefit us. It's a, it's a word that we need to hear for our day, for our time, right here, right now. So, no story, no nothing. We're just going to we're gonna dig in. But before we do, let's just lift up this time in prayer. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we thank you for gathering us together as brothers and sisters, as friends, as a body of believers, as a family, to worship you, to praise you, to lift up our prayer and petition to you, to sing to you, and to hear your word, to think upon it, to dwell upon it, and have it change our lives. God, speak to us through your word right now. Father God, I pray that you speak through me, and then I give you, and Father God, I pray that you give us all hearts to hear the message that you need us to hear this day. We ask this in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Okay, so before we get into Revelation 21 and, and what we really need to hear, we really need to kind of set the stage a little bit. We kind of need to go back and we need to do a gross overview, if you will, kind of like a Revelation recap, all the way from chapter 1 all the way up to chapter 20 to kind of bring us up to speed. And, and that's a really a lot of territory. But we have to understand what's going on. Why was this letter written? What was, what was his intention, right? Now, we know that it was written by the Apostle John, and at this point, in this stage in his life, he, he wasn't exactly a spring chicken. In fact, he was older than almost every single one sitting here in the congregation today, hearing my voice. The Apostle John, at this point, is well into his 90s, and he's in prison in the island of Patmos, which is on the west coast of modern-day Turkey. And he was writing a letter as Jesus gave it to him. He was enraptured up into this vision as his earthly body is sitting in a prison cell on this prison island on Patmos. And he's enraptured into this vision, if you will. And he starts speaking to the angel of the Lord and to the Lamb of God, to Jesus Christ. And Jesus says to him, I'm going to give you this word and I want you to write a letter, seven letters to the seven churches in the provinces of Asia. All these churches, there were seven churches, and we, and we started to hear about those last year, and they are all in modern-day Turkey, not far from what we heard last week in the city of Colossae and Laodicea. They're all, if you look on a map and you see Turkey kind of coming around like this, and the Mediterranean Sea right here, well, the island of Patmos was like right there, and these seven cities are like all right here. They're very close to one another, I would say within maybe an hour and a half's drive today of one another. Not, not very far from one another. Very close to where the Apostle John was, relatively speaking. And Jesus has a word for these seven churches. And these seven churches, while they were real-life congregations and had real-life issues that needed to be addressed, today they represent the whole of Christendom. And... Well, life wasn't going too well. The church overall was, well, they were kind of flailing around a little bit. They were wavering. They were upside down in their faith. They were turbulent. And the times weren't exactly the, the easiest to live through. After the destruction of the temple in 70 AD, life was Hard And even around that time, Jews were rising up around the world. Christians were a brand new sect of religion. And they were doing things that were making the Roman Empire look kind of bad. Like starting hospitals, feeding the poor, taking people on in, loving one another, rejecting the worship of Caesar. 
And at this time, in this earlier period, before John was an old, old man, Caesar Nero rose to power. And Nero was a tyrannical maniac, a complete nut job. I mean, to put it lightly. And in a fit of maniacal rage, Nero set fire to one-third of Rome. Literally, one-third of Rome burned. Well, like a good politician, he blamed it on somebody else. In fact, he blamed it on the Christians. And life got really horrendous for the Christians. They went into hiding. They had to flee. Because if they were caught, they were persecuted. They were thrown in the arena. The Colosseum hadn't even been finished being built at this time. It was still under construction, but they still had arenas. And they were thrown to the lions. They were thrown to the, to the bears. They were crucified. And not just crucified, and this is going to sound a little gruesome, but they were hung up on poles in the middle of the street to be lit on fire at night, to be torches, to be city lights, if you will. It's a really gross, disgusting thought. But that was Nero, and that's what the Christians had in their mind. of This is what life was like for Christians under the rule of Nero. Well, Nero was eventually taken out. Life got a little bit better for the Christians. But a decade later, well, a couple decades later, a a generation later, if you will, Domitian came to power. About the time John is imprisoned in the island of Patmos, and Domitian, by all accounts, wasn't a very nice guy either. In fact, he made life a living hell for the Christian church. And so this is the context that's being written as John is writing his letter to the seven churches. As Jesus is giving a vision, we have to understand the world, the mindset that these Christians were living in. They were living in absolute fear of what could happen if they spoke up and said that they worship the one true God, Yahweh, Jesus Christ. And the overall message that Jesus needed them to hear And that John was conveying is, I know it's bad for you. God knows how bad it is for you. He sees your plight, but you need to hold on to your faith. And that was a message that John's contemporary hearers needed to hear as much as we do. Because for the next portion of the letter... John goes on to describe these visions that are given to him by Jesus Christ that Antichrist will arise and and declare himself as God on earth and demand that you worship him. And if you don't bow down and worship him, and not just him, but his system of governments, his system of economy, the whole thing, that off goes your head. You will lose your life. Wars would arise, the likes of which we have never seen in any of our lifetimes. And rumors of wars. So bad that a third of humanity will be killed. Plagues, famine, natural disasters will come and and ravage the human species. Demons will arise, spiritual torment will happen. The planet will get decimated. So bad so that John has these visions of of mountains on fire that come screaming down out of the cosmos and land on planet Earth and a third of the oceans get burned up. A third of animal life, a third of humankind gets burned up. The seas turn to blood red. I mean, visions of apocalypse, right? We we think of this as maybe an asteroid impact, an, an alley an extinction level event, if you will, or a nuclear holocaust, something that bad that we put in our minds, something that has yet to take place. Another third of humanity gets killed off. A third of the oceans and animal life is decimated. And the big question for us really becomes, with God's final judgment seemingly so far off, because we know that these things haven't taken place in the magnitude that are described in the book of Revelation. And with a brand new heaven and a brand new earth seemingly so far off. What's the message God needs us to understand today? The same message that John's contemporaries 
needed to understand in their day. And that message, in a nutshell, up until this point, has really been this. It's going to be hell on earth, so hold on to your faith in Jesus Christ. Because after this, Jesus is going to come again. And you who have endured through it all, you who are still alive, you who did not waver and give in to Antichrist, you who have ever believed in the one and only name of Jesus Christ and confessed him as your Lord and Savior, well then, together, Jesus is going to enrapture you up into heaven. And together with the saints who have gone before us, you are going to meet Christ in the air. And together, we are all going to descend with Christ and rule with him on this earthly plane for 1,000 years as evil is bound in peace like we've never experienced. Reigns for 1,000 years. But then, after this millennial period is over, Satan will be released for a short time to try to deceive the elect, if he can, according to Scripture. But he's doomed. His fate is over. He will be cast into the pit forever. It will be sealed. And everyone who has ever lived, from Adam and Eve all the way up to those who are born during the millennium, again, which hasn't happened yet, will be judged for what they have done, what they haven't done, and what they have left done. And about that moment, that moment that is yet to happen, John wrote these words in Revelation chapter 20, starting in verse 11. And I saw a great white throne and one sitting on it, and the earth and sky fled from his presence. But they fell in no place to hide. I saw the dead, both great and small, standing before God's throne, and all the books were open, including the book of life. And the dead were judged according to what they had done, as recorded in the books. And the sea gave up its dead, and the death and the grave gave up their, their, gave up their dead, and all were judged according to their deeds. Then death and the grave were thrown into the lake in fire. This lake of fire is the second death. And if anyone whose name was not found recorded in the book of life was then thrown into the lake of fire. And again, John's message to the church up into this point is, again, hold on to the faith in which you have received, no matter what, because your reward in the life to come is going to be greater than anything you can imagine, even if it means losing your life in the here and now. But if you don't, If you don't trust in Jesus, your end is going to be your final end. It's a message that gets a little scary to hear. And so with all this in mind, John then goes on to encourage his readers with the following vision. We get now into Revelation chapter 21. Then I saw a new heaven. And a new earth, for the old heaven and the old earth had disappeared. And the sea was gone, and I saw a holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven like a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. The simplified message of, of everything else that we're going to hear, and even this portion, but really narrowing in here, is, is guys, y'all, it, it's going to be heaven on earth. Literally. And unimaginably good. He talked about how the old earth would be gone, how the sea would disappear. We hear that in verse 1 and 2. Is this literally, the, this earthly plane is going to poof, disappear, and there's going to be a brand new one? Is the, does it literally mean that there's going to be no ocean life? Is this literal? Is it metaphorical? Maybe both. But in a, in a metaphorical sense, what John needed his readers to hear is that while the old earth represents sin, it represents fallen human nature, a fallen planet. It, it represents death and sorrow, plague, illness, everything that needs to be renewed so we can have Eden once more. 
And the sea, while we think that it means water, and it very well could, also represents things that are storms of life and, and danger and darkness. When you look at the book of Revelation, anytime the word sea, S-E-A, is mentioned, it's always in conjunction with the beasts that come up out of the sea. The Antichrist, the devil, Satan, this one world governance that they are demanding everybody bow down and worship. And Jesus was showing John that all the evil, all the danger, all the crying, all the pain, all the sorrow, death, will all be things of the past. It'll, they'll be gone forever. They'll be wiped away like Terry did on the blackboard. And along with all creation, you and I will be as God intended from the very, very beginning. Perfect. Renewed. Perfectly in his image. All made new. Literally. Heaven on earth. For all eternity. And not only that, God will be among us as we radiantly beam in his presence. And this was to inspire hope. Hope in a time of chaos and trouble. The hope of heaven on earth is what John really needed his readers and his audience to, to hold on to. It's it's the hope of renewal, a hope to the total end of all the pain and suffering and junk that we go through on a daily basis of a world gone bad and increasingly nuts. And John continued with that in his, in his vision, verses 3 through 7. He said, as we heard earlier, I heard a loud shout from the throne saying, look, God's home is now among his people. He will live with them and they will be his people. God himself will be with them. And then the scripture verse, he will wipe away every tear from their eyes and there will be no more death or sorrow or crying and pain. And all these things are gone forever. And the one sitting on the throne said, look, I'm making everything new. And he said, write this down. For what I tell you is trustworthy and true. And he said, it is finished. I'm the Alpha and the Omega the beginning and the end, to all who are thirsty, I will give freely from the springs of water of life. And all who are victorious will inherit these blessings, and I will be their God, and they will be my children. What I don't have on the screen is what follows, and I'm just going to read one paragraph of it. But cowards, unbelievers, the corrupt, murderers, the immoral, those who practice witchcraft, idolatry worship, all liars, their fate is in the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. Notice that very first thing he put on there, but cowards. Those who say, ah, I'd rather keep my own life, Antichrist. No, I'll take it off my head. I'll renounce Jesus. He is saying to them, hold on to your faith because it's going to be heaven on earth. And this needs to inspire hope. Because God is going to be with us. And where the Lord is, peace reigns. Where the Lord is, there is warmth and love and light. And darkness just cannot exist in that atmosphere. Pain, suffering, sorrow, disease, and death eradicated. Hatred, anger, evil, things completely forgotten. So beside the book of Revelation, really painting kind of a harsh message, and a message of doom and gloom, it was also a message that was intended to inspire hope. That we're to set our hearts before God in Christ Jesus. And really the whole message of the whole book the whole book, from beginning all the way to end, from the very first word in Genesis, in the beginning, to the very last word in Revelation, is hope in God, that God was renewing and making all things new, and that no matter how much stuff comes our life, we can have hope, even in our time. A culture 
in our own myopic lens here in the United States of America that seemingly is like Sodom and Gomorrah, a time when we wonder, am I going to have money in the bank in a month from now or is the whole thing going to fall apart? Are my children going to get led off to war as the drums are beating over in Eastern Europe right now? Threats of nuclear annihilation. Plagues rising up that have ravaged our country and our world. It's kind of a scary time for us right now, but even at that, it could be a whole lot worse. A whole lot worse. So no matter what, no matter if it's as bad as it is now or if it gets really, 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 really bad, Jesus' message for you and for me and for all of us is no matter what may come, hold on to Jesus. Hold on to him and, and grasp on to him and have your hope and faith and trust in him because if you do that, then everything is going to be all right in the end. And for you, it will literally be heaven on earth. Just hold on until the end. So really the big idea, which I could have summed up right away, is no matter how dark the days become, let your hope for heaven on earth really comfort your soul. It's that simple. Our days are dark. And they may get darker. But no water wet. Hold on to God. Hold on to one another. And hold on to your hope. And everything will be okay in the end. Let's pray. God, Heavenly Father, we don't know any other days than the days that we're living in and the days that have come before us that we've experienced in our lifetimes. We can know going through history that days have been really dark for the church and for humanity in the past. We thank you for helping them get through those days. No matter what comes our way, Father God, we pray that you give us hope to hold on to. Hope in Jesus Christ. Hope of no more death, no more sour, no more pain. That you will wipe it all away and make all things new. A new heaven, a new earth. Heaven on earth for all who believe. Help us to hold on to that hope, Father God. In and through your Son, Jesus Christ. And in his name we pray.